Welcome everybody, this is the Database Systems Core Lecture. My name is Jens Dittrich and today we will be talking about query processing. So this is the agenda and that is where we are. Last time we talked about how to find stuff at scale. In particular we talked about indexing the different index structures that are available. Basically the most important takeaway message was, well, there's B-trees. B-trees will most likely solve your problem. Uh, today we are switching towards how to compute complex queries at scale. And that's a very long story and a crucial story uh, if, you wanna, if you really want to scale and be able to handle big, large data sets. And to start, we will uh, start by looking at what's called query processing. That's the most important algorithms you will need to be able to process data. And then we look into different operator models, we look into optimization algorithms, many, many things that are out there, but we start relatively simple today. And maybe some of you have seen this table in at least my undergrad lecture, Big Data Engineering, I show this table, and it basically uh, shows again the different symbols available in relational algebra here on the left, so selection, projection, Union and so forth, I wrote it down in both German and English. And, and then there are other important operators like intersection, Schnitt in German, and in particular, the join operation. Uh, join is also something you will find in SQL directly as a, um, as a keyword and it's one of the most important operations. And we have this classification, there are these so-called base operators. Those are those six operators here operators from relational algebra, and we have derived operators, and there are some extensions like, for instance, grouping and aggregation, which is super important in all kinds of analytical queries. Yeah, and basically when you, when you see a table like that, I don't make any specification. I don't say how this stuff gets implemented. Yeah? Basically, a table just shows there are these types of um, oper operators, operations, and yeah, they are important for, uh, for databases, but I don't say anything about how they are implemented. And that is something we will look at today. How would we implement such, uh, such operators? We briefly touched that in my undergrad lecture, but not to, to not in big, uh, not, not a lot. Uh, and basically the mapping to, to this course is the following. So when, when you worry about how to implement the selection efficiently, in the end, you have to talk about indexing. Basically, an index structure will allow you to implement a selection efficiently such that you don't have to scan each and every tuple, but only look at a subset of the tuples. That's, that's what we did last week. Pro projecting out data has a lot to do with columns. So rather than looking at all of the columns and uh, loading all of the attributes into main memory, you can project out early on um, the, the ones that are interesting, and that is supported super well in the column layout, of course. And most of the other algorithms are basically just variants of join algorithms. So I wrote it in quote here. So, for instance, if we later on look at grouping and aggregation, well, yeah, that's not a join algorithm in the sense, but I will make the bridge and uh, explain to you why I would still call it a join algorithm. But basically, once you understand how a join algorithm works in principle, and the classes of join algorithms that exist, then you will be able to implement all of these operators. So that's a good message. It's not that for each and every operator you have to learn five completely new algorithms. That doesn't make any sense. It's all about once you understand how a simple join can be implemented efficiently, everything else will be clear. Yeah, it's just tiny variations for these operators. And that's what we, what we will be looking at today, mostly join algorithms and then a couple of other important things. So with that, let's start with join algorithms. As last week again, I will be available on Discord on the text channel, the lecture text channel, and then in the breaks also on the audio channel. So applications for join algorithms, well, you have this keyword in SQL you join on. Yeah? If you join two relations, you can either specify the join condition through a where clause you, you make the join explicit. We had that in the undergrad lecture. And also, as shown above already, other operations like intersect and accept in SQL can be mapped directly to join algorithms. Group by, as already said on the relational algebra level, can also be mapped to joins. And another important thing is subqueries. So if you nest queries inside the SQL statement, we also briefly touched that in the undergrad lectures. 
those queries can also be rewritten to, to join statements um, in, in many cases. Well, the important thing for the following discussion is the following, uh, that is, there are basically only four classes of join algorithms. Uh, there's nested loop, there's index nested loops. This also inc includes uh, the most important algorithm to, to compute a join is uh, called a simple hash join. That's part of that class here. And there's sort merge algorithms, and then there's partition-based algorithms. We will only look at the first three due to time constraints. Um, basically, sort mer merge is the inverse of partition, and partition is the inverse of sort merge in a way. Yeah? But, but we will look, at, I prefer to look, at, to look a bit more detail in sort merge because once you understand that, you will understand many, many important algorithmic patterns. So with that, let's start with a simple algorithm, the most uh, trivial algorithm that it's called a nested loop join. And um, I denoted it as follows. So this is my join predicate. I assume I have two relations R and S. Uh, here is shown on the top right. I have this join predicate. And basically, it defines an equality predicate uh, that tells me, OK, the join predicate is true if attribute x is equal to attribute x in S. Uh, attribute x in R is equal to attribute x in S. If that is the case, this join predicate returns true. Uh, and the algorithm is uh, super simple. What do you do? If you have as an input the two relations, relation R, relation S, and the join predicate, then I write it here in pseudocode, pseudocode syntax and say, OK, for each tuple in R, for each R in R, I nest another loop for each S and S. And then I check whether the join predicate holds for this spe specific combination of R and S. Yeah, so basically call the join predicate with the two tuples I have in my hands here with R and S. And only if it holds, so if the join predicate holds, I output the resulting tuple. So basically saying I create a new tuple consisting of the, um, the tuple on the, the R tuple and the S tuple. I could unroll the attributes, of course, and pack it into one flat tuple. Yeah, that's what a database would be doing. But just to, to, to tell you the, the principle that's behind that. And of course, well, that that is exactly equivalent to computing the cross product. If you remember relational algebra, cross product, square complexity, and then filtering out all the qualifying tuples. That's a trivial way of writing a join. We did that in the undergrad lecture many, many times. Um, so doing the cross product, square complexity, and then filtering out all of the results. And that's basically what this algorithm does. So it has a square complexity in the number of input tuples. So if R and S, let's say, have the same size of N, then basically the complexity of this algorithm is N square. Yeah, so it's obvious this is not very efficient and won't scale for large data sets. But, but that's an algorithm you can always run. In particular, you can run this independent of the join predicate. So this is an equality join predicate, but assume this were something fancy, you're calling a cosinus or tangents or whatever fancy um, uh, function. Nested loop join will always work independent of the join predicate. The, jo the join predicate is a black box. And the algorithm just has to be able to call that black box, but it doesn't have to understand what exactly is that joint predicate, what's going on. So that's a, that's a start here. Yeah, uh, a better algorithm, it's called index nested loop join. And how does that work? Well, basically, if you go back to nested loop join, you will see there are two loops here. And now we replace that by a single loop. One of the loop, loops gets, gets removed. And we do that. We can do that in cases where there is an appropriate index available and in cases where the predicate matches that index in a certain way. You will see in a moment how exactly. So again, remember, we have an equality predicate and uh, assume we have an index. So what I'm doing with this lookup here, that's called, um, that's what a database maintains a list of the tables and of the um, index structures that exist currently in that system. And all these lists of what is available and what's um, not available is stored in the so-called catalog. That's um, a database of metadata keeping track of the indexes that exist. So I can look up that catalog to check whether there's an index on attrib attribute x of relation r. So do I have an index available allowing me to look up directly certain values in that attribute. 
That is what this line is doing. And only if that is the case, I can do the falling. If I don't have an index like that, it doesn't make any sense. But assume we have such index available, um, then I can do the following. I do a, sim a single loop now, and the loop is a looping across um, along all tuples of the one relation. So I, I got an index on R, but now I'm looping over all tuples from S. And what I'm basically doing is I translate each and every tuple from S into a query against R. So I loop over one and translate each tuple against the query against R. So we have a simple point query, as we've seen them in, in B trees when discussing B trees. And I basically say, okay, now I take this tuple S and its attribute value on X, and I um, run that as a point query against index, uh, the index R, uh, the, the index on relation R. Uh, that's the index I retrieved here. And then I receive some results. So this may be empty, but it may also contain some tuples, and those are the tuples in R that have the same attribute value X as this uh, small s. Uh, that's basically the trick I play here. And then I can simply check, oh, well, if that's not empty, if it's empty, I simply continue with the next element, I continue with the loop. But if this query result is not empty, then I just append that to the result set, which means I do a cross product of the original tuple S with the query result set. So basically, again, for, for each query result, I append the, the tuple in that query result. Those are tuples from R. Yeah? I uh, concatenated with S for each and every tuple in the query result set. And yeah, that's the algorithm. The interesting thing you might might notice here is, well, <laughs> did we even call the join predicate here? Yeah, so we passed it as a parameter. And if you go back to the nested loop join, well, here we have it in the parameter. It's a function parameter. I call it here. I use it here. Well, here I don't even use it. Yeah? I mean. Okay, I keep the same signature of the function to make sure that all join algorithms have the same signature. Yeah, that's uh, basically how I model it in, in, in this um, pseudocode explanations. But I don't really call it. Yeah? And that's one, one good and bad thing at the same time of these algorithms that um, basically these algorithms work if I understand the join predicate. So I understand the join predicate in the sense that this is equality. And I understand that equality can be mapped against a point query in an index. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Retrieving an index allowing me to run a point query. Only if that is the case, I can make use of that index and basically translate this idea of having a logical equality predicate into an index lookup. Yeah? So this means this, this algorithm only makes sense if, I, if it's a white box predicate. I can inspect the code, I understand what's going on, and then I can reason about whether I can tra translate that to an appropriate index lookup. That's a huge difference here. And that's the reason why this is not always possible. Uh, for certain predicates, it is possible. For others, it is not. However, in a standard database system, most of the, the joins that you will be running are along the foreign key constraints. And foreign key constraints are always equality predicates, always. Uh? 90% of the joints uh, or even more. And therefore, in, in, in this, uh, the standard case is that there is an equality predicate and then you can use this algorithm. Well, now let's look at an, another algorithm that you might have heard about. I think we, we briefly touched that in the big data engineering lecture. That's called the simple hash join. And how does that work? So the idea here is, again, equality predicate. Again, the same signature. But here, typically, the hash, um, the index is not available. So the first thing you do is you don't look up the catalog whether there's an index, but basically you build a hash table on attribute r.x. So that's the key you use in the hash table. So if a mapping from that key to the tuples in R having that key. And then you run a very similar algorithm. You say, okay, for each s, small s, and then capital S, you query that spe specific index. And when you when we now remember and look back at what we had before, well, basically, the only difference here is that, that you say, rather than having already the index available, I have to create it when calling this join function. Yeah. So that was a difference to the, maybe I go back to that slide here. 
Yeah, here the index was already there, but in, in the index nested loop joint scenario, I could only I could look it up. Uh, that there was no need to create the index to insert the two bits from R in the index. It was already available and usable, and I could directly start by, by running this loop on S. That's different. Different here. Here, I first built the index. I have to build the index, and that might cost something, of course. Um, um, yeah, that, that, that's that's a basic. Thing. So you you have to uh, factor in the costs for building that index. Huh? But basically, the only thing um, that, that differs here is that in, in, in this um, uh, hash, hash join, the simple hash join, um, the, the, the major message, takeaway message for you is it's the same algorithm. So if you look at what this algorithm does, and if you, if you um, in particular, if you assume that, that the index already exists, yeah, assume you have a hash table already available. Yeah, it's already there in your database system. You don't have to build it when, when calling the simple hash join. It's exactly the same algorithm as index nested loop join. Just that you say, okay, my index is a hash table. My index is not whatever index, it's a hash table. So basically just constraining the type of index. Um, and I'm explaining it. Um, and I'm explaining these uh, two names, the index nested loop join and the simple hash join, because when you look it up on the web, you will see that they're explained often as two different algorithms, when in fact they are the same algorithm. Yeah? So that's a major takeaway here. Simple hash join is just a special case of index nested loop join. It's just a special case where you use a, um, a hash index. And the other decision, whether you build the index um, at, at, at the time where you call the function, or whether the index is already available in the catalog. That's also an orthogonal to, uh, decision that shouldn't be part of the algorithmic um, description. Yeah? It's pretty orthogonal. So there we are two things we're talking about, whether the index already exists and whether um, and which type of index we're talking about. But in the end, it's all index nested loop join. So those are that is class number two. So now we had nested loop join, these two loops, square complexity, index nested loop join, Here's a complexity. Well, depends on what. Well, ob obviously you have a linear factor here, and then for each element in S, you have one lookup to the index, and then it depends on the uh, complexity, uh, the cost you pay for that lookup. So in the tree structure, there is some logarithmic term. Then basically you get some n log n complexity for a hash table. There's a constant term typically, and then you get overall a linear complexity for the algorithm. Yeah? So the runtime complexity depends on the index structure you use for these algorithms. Yeah, um, then we get to the next algorithm. Oh, I have some to do. I, re I, try, uh, I fix the colors, I fix the colors. <laughs> I should remove that to do. Um, so that, that's the example we, we will um, look at in the following. So basically we wanna join these two tables. We have a customer's relation and we have a cities dictionary. And uh, basically here you see there's a foreign key con uh, condition. So this city ID uh, is a foreign key to this key city ID in cities dictionary. Yeah? This is a primary key here, city ID in, in the cities dictionary. And name is a, um, a key here in this customer's relation. And there's a foreign key relationship. And now let's look at how we can join those two relations using a third class of algorithms that's called sort merge join. The first thing is we do is we sort both tables on that join attribute. So we sort customers on city ID and we sort cities dictionary on city ID. If it's already sorted on those attributes, fine, we don't have to do anything. But if it's not sorted, we, we, we sort it using whatever sorting method doesn't matter. Now you see it, it's sorted in ascending order. Descending will also work, it's fine. But I assume it's ascending order for both. Could be descending order for both, but now it's ascending order for both. And now let's look at what an algorithm could do here. So what I basically um, do is I keep two pointers, one for each of the relations pointing at the next element to inspect. So we have a pointer for relation R, I call it PR and relation S. And um, here, this relation is my result table. Those are the join results that are produced by this join algorithm. And now if you run the algorithm, it works as follows. It starts by inspecting the two uh, tuples that are being, that you point to currently. So currently I'm pointing to this tuple, Frank, Min Street, zero. 
zero, and here in Cities Dictionary zero, uh, zero New York. So what I do is I check whether the IDs are equal. So a city ID is, equal, uh, is zero here on the left and, and zero on the right. So they are equal. This implies this is a query result. So I add it to this table. Now, the, what I do is both point at the same value. Now I move the pointer uh, forward. And, and in this case, there's a tie. Both, both, um, both IDs are zero. I move the pointer on the left forward because that is a foreign key column. So in the next step, I move this pointer to the next element. And I, again, I have to perform the check. I check whether this is the same as that. It's obviously the same. So I, I found another join result. Now again, move the left pointer forward. Again, I do the check. There's another result. OK, I add it to the result table. Again, I move the left pointer forward. I do the check. 1 is not equal 0. Um, so I don't find a join result. And now, if both pointers are not pointing to the same um, integer, they're not equal, the condition is I move the one forward pointing to the smaller value. Now the yellow pointer is pointing to the smaller ID. 0 is smaller than 1. Therefore, I have to move the yellow pointer. Again, I perform the check. I see, OK, 1 matches 1. So that's the result. It's a tie. Both point to 1. So I move the left pointer. 1 matches 1. It's a result. Again, a tie. I move the left pointer. 5 doesn't match 1. It's not a result. The yellow pointer is smaller than the, this pointer. So I move the yellow pointer. Does 5 equal 3? No, not. It does not, so it's not a result. And so forth and so forth. So the rule is always move the smaller point, the pointer um, pointing to the smaller integer. If there's a tie, move the pointer pointing to the foreign key column, in this case on the left. Uh, then that's the situation where this algorithm works. And yeah, and I continue till, till I reach the end of the table, and basically, like that, I can compute the join result and so forth. So here's pseudocode, um, how, the, how this works. Again, I use the same signature. And again, I ignore the join predicate. Basically, the, the condition is, that's what I showed. You have to sort both relations on the join keys. Yeah, so I have to understand that this is part of the join key r.x. I sort on r.x. I sort on s.x. I initial, initialize those pointers. And then I do what I just explained in the example already. So if they match, I found a match. Um, and I output a result. If it's smaller or equal, I move the pointer on the left. There was this um, turquoise, turquoise, whatever pointer on the left. I move forward, forward. Otherwise, I move the one on the right, and so forth and so forth. Um, there's a question. Let's look at that. What happened with the sorted join if no one, no one of the two columns is the primary key? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So basically, if you go back. Here, there's a um, special situation in the sense we have duplicates in those keys. Yeah, so here, we, the 0, for instance, appears multiple times. Um, it's a foreign key column. That may happen. It's a one-to-n relationship. But here, it's a key column. Yeah, whatever value we have here, whatever key that appears here, there, mustn't be, there, there cannot be a duplicate. That's the definition of a key. Yeah. Each key appears exactly once, or at most once, to be more precise. But what happens if we have duplicates here and duplicates there. Yeah? And that could be um, I prepared a slide on that, incidentally. <laughs> so that's um, basically a, a situation like that. So here, we don't have a key anymore. We say, OK, we have the city number for whatever reason. Semantically, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but assume th here we have duplicates. And there we have duplicates. Then this algorithm doesn't work. We need a different technique. But if you think about that for a moment, this situation must not happen in a well-designed schema. If you think about how we translated n to m relationships, an n to m relationship is exactly what we're seeing here. So this one is related to multiple ones. This one here on the right is related to multiple ones. That's in the in an entity relationship, that would be an n-to-m relationship. And now remember how we translated n-to-m relationships. We did that by translating it into a one-to-n and n-to-1 relationship, which means we create an intermediate table in the middle. And that means this relationship where we have like duplicates here and duplicates there gets related, gets uh, translated into two joints, uh, a table in the middle 
And one of the attributes in those joints is always a key, problem solved. Yeah. So the, the short answer here is in a well-designed schema, this cannot happen, no way, cannot happen. Yeah. But there are special situations where, in particular, when you don't join uh, over join columns, then it may happen. Yeah. So not here, that's pretty weird, but it may happen. And if you really want to run an algorithm like that, um, then you have to do something different. And that leads to something that's called co-grouping. So what is a co-group? So here you see uh, basically visually joins the cells having the same value. And here you see it. So basically you see uh, all of these tuples have a zero. These have a one, the five, seven, nine, and so forth. Well, and now well, what does a join actually compute? If you think about that, oops, if you think about that, um, basically, where are join results possible? So join results are possible here um, among those tuples having the one and those tuples having the one here. So basically, when, when thinking about an algorithm, what an algorithm has to do is only consider certain pairs of tuples from both relations. Actually, only those tuples here on the left, only these tuples can join tuples in this group on the right here, these first three rows here in Cities Dictionary. But these tuples here can never produce a join result with any, anything else like uh, this group or the five or the seven or the nine group. That's impossible by definition. And that leads to an algorithm that's called co-grouping that I would like to briefly explain in the following again, same situation duplicates in both columns, wherever, what, wherever that is the case. Um, and basically we have the same grouping into groups. And now if you color that, so I fix the colors. Um, if you color it, you see the blue um, here matches the blue there and uh, the green doesn't match anyone here on the right and stuff like that. So basically this entire join can be translated into a series of mini joins. Only those tuples that are blue have to be joined against tuples that are blue here on the right. Um, and, um, and so forth. Yeah? So only the orange ones have to be joined with the orange ones here on the right. So maybe you think about that for a moment. So how, if I know this already, and I assume I, I, I had those core groups already available, how could I actually compute the join? And it's very important to understand the trick here. Um, I scribble it a bit on my iPad. So let's move that up. So basically, you could say we now build groups of horizontal partitions. And we talked about horizontal partitions when, when talking about um, indexes. And now I could say, OK, I have a I say the relation uh, on the left, I call it the R relation. The relation on the um, right, I call it um, the S relation, R and S. Those are the relations I'm joining. And now I build those horizontal partitions and I basically use the subscript. So I have a horizontal partition R is zero, uh, R is one, R is, uh, what do you have? Five, seven, and nine, seven, and nine. And for S, that's my city's dictionary. Um, why did I call it RS, by the way? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean R zero, of course. Yeah. R one. R one. R five. R seven. R nine. That's what I mean. And we have S one. S five and S9. So those are my horizontal partitions that I created. Okay. So the question is, how do I compute the join? Assuming that I already have those partitions available. Now I have, and basically with those numbers, I can build tuples of partitions. I can create a tuple that looks as follows. Um, I could say there's an R0 comma empty tuple because there is no S0 partition. I could create an R1 comma S1 tuple. I could create an R5 comma S5 tuple. 
and I could create and so forth and so forth. Yeah. And those tuples here, they are called the core partitions or um, the core groups. Okay. So I basically just did that by horizontally partitioning R, horizontally partitioning S, based on their join attributes, forming those horizontal partitions and just assigning partitions having the same key to the same tuple, to the same core group. And that's what I depicted here. So here's a core group, for instance, where that, that contains all tuples from R having R.x equals one, all tuples from S having S dot X, X um, uh, equaling one. And now what? How do I compute the join? That's my question. What is the idea here? Yeah, someone saying, okay, but one group one has two entries on the left and three entries on the right. That's correct, but it doesn't matter. Someone is writing cross product in core groups. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So the only thing in order to compute this join result is to do the following. I only have to consider the core groups where there's a horizontal partition for both inputs. So basically here, if you look this uh, R zero, uh, look at this R zero. Uh, there's no S zero. I don't have to do anything. But the ones where there is um, an horizontal ho horizontal partition for both, um, so like an R one and S one. The only thing I need to do here is I compute R one cross S one. I union that with um, what, what's next R five cross product S five. Union that was seven doesn't have a counterpart, so it's only, oops, no, it's R9, right? R9 cross S9. Okay, that's basically the join result in this particular case. So why don't I do a join here? That's important to understand, yeah? So one of you answered, I do a cross product, whatever. I could also do, do replace that by the original join, right? I could say, I write down the join symbol. So here I would write down, um, maybe I have to switch a little bit here, make it. I could also write down R1, join, and then whatever my predicate was. Uh, here the predicate, oops, and then S1. Why didn't I do that? Why did I write cross product? And what is the difference? Now some people are writing. Because the join predicate is already fulfilled. Yeah, that goes in the right direction. for one more answer. You can answer that by looking at the slide again. If you look, if you um, join core groups, I'm going to go to the iPad again. If you join these core groups, as yeah, someone wrote, because join and cross product are the same if the predicate is always true. That's a very uh, good answer. That's exactly right. Because, I mean, I created certain invariants in this case. I said, okay, if I build the cross product here for each and every combination, for each tuple in the cross product, say R1 cross product S1, the join predicate will be true. That is how I partitioned the data in the first place. So there is no added benefit in computing the join here. I have to compute the cross product anyway. I don't gain anything by running this through a join algorithm, which might filter out certain results. There's no, no way I can filter out results here. It is a cross product by definition. Yeah. So basically once I partitioned it into those core groups um, in an equality join scenario, and that's what we are in here, then I can simply run the cross product and, and then I'm done. Yeah? And this idea of computing the join is called a core grouped join or generalized co-group join. 
Okay, um, back to the slides. So here I explained the situation using a sort-based approach, like sort merge join. Both attributes are sorted, but I have similar effects when I do hash-based approaches or partition-based approaches. So for instance, even in a, situ a scenario where I don't sort the data on the attributes, I could identify those core groups just using colors here. Yeah? So the orange here on the left belong to um, the same core group as this orange on the right. And then how I do that algorithmically doesn't matter. As long as I um, as, long, as long as I'm able to bring those orange tuples together, the only thing that's left to do for me is to compute the cross product. Yeah? Of course, you, you must not put all tuples uh, from both relations into one set and then do like a self cross product. That would be uh, incorrect. Eh? You keep one uh, part of the um, core group for tuples from the left relation, one part from the right relation, and then you do the cross product uh, uh, of these two and that's it, all, all you have to do. Huh? Yeah, that's called a uh, core group join. And here's a um, pseudocode for that. I don't think we have to discuss that in detail. But basically what you do is you partition along the join, uh, the same uh, criterion um, as done in the indexing slides. You build those um, groups and then you, um, you probe these two uh, against one another. Um, and one, one trick, however, that that's always confuses um, people when looking at this join is in, in the previous example, we really have a special case here that you we build core groups in a way that we can do a cross product inside a, a core group. That doesn't have to be the case. So that's more general here in this pseudocode. Basically, um, so eventually you go through these core groups and then you have to determine, okay, what to do with these two sets available in the core groups. And that doesn't have to necessarily be a cross product. So you can also run the core group. Um, for instance, I mean, if you go back here um, to, to illustrate an example, I could also build core groups, for instance, here in this example and say, okay, on the left, I built a core group for all numbers that are, equal, uh, that are odd and another core group for, for the ones that are even. So then I have two core groups and I do the same on the right. So I have an odd uh, core group and an even core group. And then, of course, you're not allowed to do a cross product just across uh, the odd numbers and the even numbers. That would not be correct. Yeah? There you really have to uh, run a join. So you have to be careful when using that join to understand, okay, is it enough to run a cross product or do I still have to run a real join algorithm inside such a core group? Yeah? So that's an important distinction. We have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, with that, I would like to switch to grouping and aggregation. So, um, so the, the bottom line in grouping and aggregation is uh, it's very similar algorithms. So hash-based grouping, um, so grouping, of course, you should, should know that from, from SQL is uh, you have a group by statement somewhere in the SQL clause. Yeah? And uh, for each group, you compute the aggregate. And th the grouping algorithm is very similar to an index nested loop algorithm. What is the difference? Um, you only have one input. You group on a single table. In a, in a join, in a simple hash join where you combine two tables, it's always two tables that are combined using this hash index. Here it's one table that's not combined in the sense but more condensed. Yeah? So basically uh, the, the trick you play is you, you create a hash map and um, then you have entries in the hash map mapping from your grouping key to the actual tuples um, that have that grouping key. Yeah, maybe we can also, maybe I can visualize that and explain it here. Assume we wanted to group on city ID, for instance, uh, in, in the customer's relation. Yeah? Forget about the second city's dictionary, dictionary relation. Assume we want to group customers on city ID. Well, then we have as many groups as there are different numbers in the city ID column. Yeah? So that would be I can write that down in SQL again. Um, it's a little refresh, refresher. I could say, okay, we write something like select, um, what do we want to do? City ID, city ID, let's say count star from, 
what's it called? Customers group by city ID. Yeah. So I hope you remember from your undergrad class that what does it do? It horizontally partitions this relation based on this grouping key. The grouping key is city ID, city ID here. So basically that is a key used for horizontal partitioning. So it's the same as in this core grouping algorithm. However, I only have one, one input, not two. So it's just a group, not a core group. That's, that's, that's a, a similarity here. So I have the same coloring. So for instance, I will have one group for all the nines, one for this orange group, the blue is all for the ones and stuff like that. And then in order to compute uh, the result of that, in what the algorithm does is, let's go through um, to the pseudocode here. Um, let's switch to the slide again. What it does is it loops over the input over our relation that happens here. So very similar as in an index nested loops and checks whether there's an entry for the group key. The group key is X uh, that was in our, um, in the example I just used, it was the city ID. Here's a city ID that was a group key here. Yeah, that is the X in this example. And it checks whether there's already an, ent an entry in that hash map for that specific group. Yeah? If that's not the case, it will create a new entry and it will append um, a list to that. Yeah? So basically a list of tuples having that grouping key. Um, if there is already an entry, which means there was a tuple already uh, um, considered previously that has a grouping key, you just have to uh, retrieve um, the existing entry. So basically what I'm doing is here, uh, for each group I maintain a list of the tuples having that key. Uh, that's why here I create a new list here I get the existing list from the hash map. Then I append the current tuple R to that list and then I put it into the hash table. Uh, so this, in the case, uh, the key was already available in the hash table. This is, should symbolize it replaces the existing entry. Uh, so this puts an entry into the hash map, grouping key, comma, the group. So the list of tuples having that key. That's the only thing that happens here. And you do that for each and every tuple. Uh, you loop over the entire relation and uh, once you're done, once this loop terminates, you have all your data partitioned horizontally according to the grouping condition. That's the entire algorithm for grouping it. Now comes aggregation. So again, it's also explained in the underway lecture, first grouping, then aggregation. Well, if you go back to the SQL statement, so basically this defines the grouping part. Yeah? That's the grouping, grouping or partitioning horizontally. But now comes, okay, we have to output this stuff and that's defined here in the select clause. So we wanna have the key of the group, comma, count star. Count star meaning for each and every tuple I output, for each group, yeah, for each group computed here, I will output one tuple and the tuple has the group key, this one, and the count star means the number of tuples in that group, that's this one. So that happens in pseudocode uh, what's my pseudocode? Here it is at this part uh, for each key in the hash map. So basically now I uh, get an iterator from the hash map uh, with, with all the entries. And for each key, I get the tuples in the hash map having that key. And then I run the actually aggregation function. In this case, it's a count start. It can be some average, minimum, maximum, whatever you want, right? But, but here it's count star in the example. So basically I get the group, compute the count star, and then I output one tuple. That is a group key, grouping key, and the aggregation result. So that's the second part. So you can see it here, it's strictly two parts. This first part, this loop on the left is horizontal partitioning. And what happens here is the actual aggregation. Aggregation happens within each group independently. And for each group you output one tuple. But again, it's the same trick. You basically just put everything into an index and then output everything. That's it. Yeah, so it's very similar to index nested loops. Yeah, with that, I would say we do a little break and we continue 10 past one. I will be available in the audio channel of Discord. See you soon.
Okay, let's continue. So we looked at hash-based grouping and aggregation. We did, we, uh, there's also a sort-based grouping and aggregation. So how does that work? Uh, here's a pseudocode for that. It's again super similar to sort, merge, join. So the main idea here is you sort the input relation on the grouping key, r dot x, so that's this call in this example. Then um, you keep a pointer to the current element and then you run through the group till that pointer changes. So um, without having to, I think we don't have to go through all of these, but I basically now um, switch to, how do we do that? So maybe if you look at one of these examples we had for, um, I think that's a good one. So basically you can now um, explain the same thing using the same slide I used for explaining sort merge join. And you remember that was a slide, so we had these two pointers, one for each relation. Well, now we only have one pointer. We have one relation, so there is no join in that sense, but algorithmically we're doing the same thing. So just look at the customer's relation on the left and ignore what's happening on the right. So basically we keep a pointer in sort-based grouping, um, and initially we um, keep um, the current grouping key. We have um, a variable pointing to the current grouping key, and that is, city, uh, that is zero, uh, zero currently. So as long as we are pointing to a tuple with the same grouping key, then we are within the same group, obviously. So basically, now again, only look at the left. So what we're doing is we, maybe I can hide that slide somewhere. <laughs> Shall I do that? Um, yeah, let's do a little trick here. Let's do a little trick here. Um, so, so it's like that. I will try to hide that part now, making it simpler. Okay, this is a hot fix for my slide. Oops, here we go. No, I've hidden all of it. So you're only looking at the left, okay? So basically, um, what you, what you see is I have this pointer. Now I jump, um, I, I iterate through the sorted relation according to that grouping key, which is city ID in this example. And only when the value changes, I have to do something. So basically whenever I am at this boundary here, you know, whenever I'm here, oops, when I'm at this boundary here, where I switch to uh, one, yeah? Then I have to do something. I collected those three tuples having the zero, and now I have one group identified, the, the group of tuples having zero. They, they, are, they are adjacent to each other in the relation because I sorted according to the city ID, and then I compute the aggregate directly on those tuples. So at all times, I only have to keep tuples belonging to a single group yeah? once I computed the aggregate. So in this case, assume again, I just count the number of tuples, then I count them, that's three in that case, and throw away all of those tuples I stored in between. That's the entire trick you play. So basically you, you iterate, you move the pointer over that relation till that city ID changes. Once it changes, well, you, you entered a new group and whatever you collected so far, you compute the aggregate and then throw that aggregate away. So maybe we briefly look into that pseudocode, it is, um, let's go, hash base grouping, here we go, that's this one, yes, so that's the main idea, you sort it, then you um, initialize a pointer, just like in the sort of merge join, and ba basically here that's the current group value, that's what I just used, yeah, the zero, I started with zero initially, and that is a, a list you keep uh, that's basically the list of tuples that, curl, um, that are currently have the value you're pointing to. And then basically you run a loop. So if the current tuple belongs to the same group, so it's, um, uh, it's basically uh, this branch, yeah? um, so I could have uh, yeah, I've written it differently, but anyway, that's how it is. So basically I check whether it's not equal the current group value. If it's not equal, I have to do something. But if it's equal, the only thing I'm doing is I append the tuple to the current group of um, 
uh, tuples having that value and continue looping, 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 looping. And once the pointer is on the new value, it must be something greater, uh, so it's strictly greater, then I compute the aggregate on the current group, output the current group value and the aggregation result, and I reinitialize that group. Basically, I remove all elements from that list, and then I start all over. And so I start uh, um, with a new group, iterate over those values. That's basically the idea of the algorithm, and super similar to uh, sort merge join, of course. Yeah. yeah, with that, I would spend some more time on what's called external merge sort. What is external merge sort? It's a very classical algorithm allowing you to sort data that's bigger than the available main memory. Yeah, assume you want to sort whatever, a petabyte of data, but you only have three kilobytes of main memory available. This algorithm is going to work. Because this algorithm is going to work as long as you have three pages of main memory available, you can sort arbitrarily large data sets. It's a very classical algorithm. And you might think, oh, sorting, that's boring, right? No, you will learn many interesting patterns, algorithmic patterns that reappear all over the place in, in data, data management and are useful in data management. So I will initially start with a core trivial, no, no, not trivial, but, but plain algorithm. And then I extend it here and there. And uh, I just, I cannot show you all, all extensions. There are many, many tricks you can play. That's the most basic uh, variant of the algorithm I'm, ex I'm explaining, but some extensions I, I, I will be showing you today. And uh, that will also allow you to, to uh, write database better um, database algorithms. So how does that work? So in the following, I consider um, this scenario. So these orange boxes are my pages. Yeah? I told you, okay, page is like four kilobyte typically on some storage device. I made them super, super small. I say, okay, the page is super small. It only has two integers, very small pages uh, just to just allowing me to, to display the stuff on the screen. So basically here on top you see we have four, pa uh, sorry, eight pages, uh, each having two integers, which means we have 16 values in total we, are, we, we will be sorting in the following. That is my scenario, but of course you have much larger files in practice just uh, for the sake of a simple explanation. And in order to process that data, I will need some main memory. I will assume uh, for the moment, I only have two pages of my memory to just show you uh, the principle of what happens here. So the first thing you do in external merge sorting is you create so-called runs. What does it mean? You fill up your main memory with as much data as possible. Well, here my main memory only has two pages. So what I do is I load two pages from the input file into main memory. That happens here. The first two pages got loaded. Now, inside main memory, I can sort using an arbitrary main memory sorting algorithm. Could be quick sort, merge sort, as main memory merge sort, whatever, heap sort, yeah, um, up to you. Let's assume it's quick sort, doesn't matter, just one main memory, just a main memory sorting algorithm. I sort it, that happens here, now I have uh, two, three, four, six, and now I write those two pages out again to external memory, let's say hard disk or an SSD, that happens here. Yeah? So now I have a run, and I changed the colors here, but it's still two pages, uh, read from top to bottom, saying the first page has numbers two, comma, two and three, and the next page has numbers four, comma, six. That is an output file uh, I created, and that's also called a run. Run meaning there's some ascending or descending sequence of numbers in that run. So I have an as ascending sequence of numbers in this particular run. Now I... Um, Simplify, um, no, no, the, oh, I forgot one part, of course, now you discard the uh, main memory, of course, you don't need that, they don't need to keep that in main memory anymore. And in the following, for simplification, I don't show you this uh, loading and sorting in main memory and discarding and blah, 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 blah. I simplify the visualization by saying, okay, I just write an arrow. And this arrow symbolizes, okay, I read two input pages from the input file, sort it, write it out again, and I end up with a sorted output run. Yeah? So two unsorted input pages yield two sorted output pages. Yeah? That's basically all I'm showing. And now the algorithm, external merge sort, was a, what it does is in pass zero is it creates runs from those input files. Yeah? So for the first two pages, now the next two pages, and so forth. So basically, yeah, as it's two input, um, 
as I can load two uh, pages at a time in my memory, this yields four runs of two pages each. And that is what I end up with in pass zero. Now from that, you start merging those smaller runs into larger runs. So basically what you do, you have a merge operation that needs at, mo um, at least three pages of main memory. And that is why that is the lower bound. Uh, so I could have used three pages already for run generation, but for the sake of uh, having a simple visualization, I used two. But anyway, whatever you do in external sorting, you will need three pages of main memory. Well, that should be available in, in, in like all. Why wouldn't you have three pages of main memory? Yeah? But that's the minimum. And of course, you can uh, use more main memory but what, what happens here is basically from um, each input run, and in this example, it's only two, you could merge, merge much more input runs at the same time. I'm in the visualization, um, I have two input runs. Those two here are merged into a single output run. And as I have two input runs of two pages each, the uh, resulting output run must have four pages, obviously. But I could, all, but I could uh, also have merged <coughs> all the four two-page input runs using a single merge with four inputs into a single output run. Yeah? That's a configuration parameter. And um, I hope we have time to talk about that uh, in the lab on Friday, because there are many um, trade-offs here that have to be factored in. But just Conceptually, that is what happens. Yeah? So here, the minimum is two, yeah, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Basically, you load one page from this run, one page from that run, and now you merge them to an output page. Yeah? You um, basically, <clears throat> and this is kind of, a, of misleading uh, in this example, actually. Um, so what you load is you would have to load the two and three first and the four and seven first. That's yeah, it's a bit misleading, sorry for that here. I fix it. Uh, visualization, so this page gets loaded first and that page gets loaded first. And then you pick, uh, um, pick the minimum element and output it to the output page. Yeah? So you always pick the minimum from the two input runs that is available in main memory, output it to the output page once the output page is fully write it to disk. If um, one of the pages you're reading from the input is empty, you, you read the next page. And with that process, you can basically merge two streams of sorted, um, of sorted data into a sorted output stream, this run. And you do that for all the output runs. And in the end, you end up with two runs of four pages each. Yeah? Now, we only have two runs. And then, of course, you could, again, merge them into a larger run of eight pages using a single uh, merge and so forth. Yeah. So, and then in the end, you end up with an H8 page run, and that contains all the data that was available in the input file. And at no point in time, you, you kept all the input file in main memory. Yeah. So that's called external merge sort. And here's pseudocode for how this works. The main trick is you have to keep a heap with the metadata. So that's a heap collecting metadata about the currently existing runs. And as a priority, uh, there are many, many ways you, uh, to do that, but the, the easiest is to keep as priority the smallest run. So in the heap, the top element is the, uh, the run having the smallest size. As a sm pages or elements doesn't matter, smallest size, which means in the following, we will always draw the smallest run. Then we run um, a loop as follows. That's the pass zero I explained so far. So basically, I read the input that is this relation R here, and keep on generating runs. I cr create runs for all data available in the input. And whenever I create such run, I add the metadata to the heap. So don't get confused here. I don't add the data available in the run to the heap. No, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm adding just a pointer, a reference, the metadata, that allowing me to look it up later on. Um, to that heap. That's all I'm doing here. So I basically, the heap collects all of my runs using its priority smallest run first. And once I finish, uh, I'm finished with pass zero, yeah? creating runs, I start with passes one and following as shown in the example above. I basically run a while loop um, that determines whether the heap has more than run one run available. Yeah, so if it's more than one run, that implies, well, I still have to merge stuff, right? So basically, I 
um, initialize a list of inputs to merge. Those are my runs. Yeah. Now from these, um, from the heap, I remove the top f runs. Why f? And so this is a shortcut for, for saying um, I will, this is a fan in. Uh, you remember we had fan out and been talking about B trees, children of a, of a node and a B tree. This is fan in. This is like the opposite saying I merge f runs at the at a time. In the example, f was equal to, but this can be anything greater uh, equal to is fine. Uh, so it could be 10, whatever. Yeah? So maybe I remove the, the, the 10 runs with the smallest size from the heap. Those are my inputs. And for those inputs, I um, call a merge operation. I merge those runs, which yields one final run. Yeah? This run is then added, or the metadata for that run is then added to the, um, to the heap again. So that's basically the, uh, the idea here in this loop. You remove f runs from the heap shown here. You merge those runs with the merge operation, however that's implemented. That yields an output run. The metadata for that run is added again to the heap. And then again, you enter the loop here. And well, as long as you have more than one run, metadata for uh, more than one run on that heap, while well, you keep on merging, merging, merging. Eventually, you only have a single run on the heap, which means you, you perform the last merge. You now have a single sort sequence of your entries on disk, and then you're done. That's the idea of external merge sort. It's a very fundamental algorithm. And um, it has a couple of interesting extensions and algorithmic uh, games you can play here. And one is when you look at the standard run generation, that's what we considered so far. So we had quick sort. Quick sort meaning, well, you can load, again, assume we have only two pages available. You load two pages in my memory, sort them, write them out to disk. That's exactly what we see here. So basically, the size of a run created in the in pass zero is the size of the available main memory, obviously, right? Yeah, so this is the two pages we had available. And depending on your merge strategy, depending on the, um, on the fan end for the merges you use, that may um, um, lead to many, many um, merge levels. And interestingly, there's an algorithm that does the following. Even if you have um, in this scenario, only two pages may be available, this algorithm may create runs that are longer than the available main memory. And there's no guarantee that it is double the size as visualized here, or that it is bigger than, um, than, than two pages. Can, can could also happen that the algorithm creates a run of size two pages only. It can even be three um, times or four times the size of the input. And how would that work? Yeah, so how would you create, how, how, how does an algorithm work that's able to create a run longer than the available main memory. And that algorithm is called replacement selection. And I would like to explain how that works uh, in the following. So assume the following scenario, we have an input sequence of input elements depicted here on the right. And I ignore pages for the moment because that just um, complicates matters to understand algorithmically what replacement selection is doing. We can get rid of pages for the moment, but of course in the context of a database system that will be mapped to pages. So we have the sequence of input elements that are not sorted. We want to sort them. We have an output to run that we want to create that's, that's empty currently. We have an available main memory um, shown on, on top here of four elements. So at all times we can keep at most four elements. Yeah? And what I show in the uh, middle here is two data structures, a heap and a list. And um, in reality, they're, they're, they're fused into one structure where one half is a heap or one part is a heap and the other is a list and uh, which part is a heap. So the boundary between the two may, may be moved. But um, to, to explain to you the idea, um, I show them as two separate structures here. So and in order to keep that constraint that I only keep four elements at a time, this must be true. So at all times, the sum of elements in those two structures must be smaller equal m, then, then everything is fine. Then I keep that constraint. So I start this algorithm as follows. What I do is I look at the first four elements in my input. Yeah, that's, at my, uh, that's what I can load. And I put them into the heap. Well, the heap property 
basically the heap creates a half order. So this priority, I don't have to fully sort it, but for visual purposes, I sort it. So basically, um, now I have an ascending um, order of elements here. Uh, the heap doesn't fully sort it. Yeah, you should know that from the algorithm and data, data structures uh, class. This can be done in linear time, by the way. You bike load the heap uh, in linear time. So now what happens is um, in the algorithm, you remove the first element from the heap, that is a 10, and write it to the output sequence. That happens on the next slide. I always uh, mark what happens here on the title slide. So remove top element 10 from heap and write it to output run. That happens here. So now this slot here in the heap is empty. And 10 is the first element in the, in the run we created. Um, what I do now in the following, I keep a variable showing um, the last element I output. Yeah? So the value of the last element, that is 10, obviously. Yeah? If I didn't have anything before, but now it's 10. 10 was the last element I output. And now I have... Um, what I, what I will do in the following, I will draw the next element from the input. And so the trick of this replacement selection algorithm is to always make a comparison. Is the next element I'm about to draw smaller or equal the last element I just um, row, um, wrote out to the output run? So in other words, I have to look at this number, at the 10, so it's the last element on the output, 10, and compared with the next I'm about to draw from the input. If this element I'm drawing is, is bigger, equal the one I just output, I can, I'm allowed to put it in the heap. If, if this were smaller, yeah, assume we had a, whatever, a nine here rather than the 25, well then I wouldn't be allowed to put it into the heap, then I would have to put it into the list. We will have that, uh, I will show it in a moment how that works, yeah? but, but um, let's go through the, I will show, uh, illustrate the different cases in the following. So, I want to draw 25, so I have to compare against the last output. That's 10, 25 is greater or equal 10. Everything is fine. 25 will be put into the heap. I maintain the heap property visualized as a sorted sequence. So now the, the heap uh, looks like that. Well, the next, uh, I again um, proceed by uh, removing the top element from the heap, which is 20. I write it to the output run. That happens here. Now I have an output run of 10, 20. This one is empty. I'm about to draw 73. My last element written to the output is 20. So I'm, now I have to compare 73. Is it greater or equal 20? Yeah, that's true. So everything is fine. I draw 73, put it into the heap, maintain the heap property, and um, I'm done for the moment. Now I proceed. I again remove the top element, which is 25 remove it, um, I put it to the um, output run. Now the last element output is 25. The next element I'm about to draw is 16. Is 16 greater or equal 25? No, it's not, that's false. So in this situation, I'm not allowed to put 16 into the heap, but I must put it into a separate list. That happens here. So I'm not allowed to put it here. This key, um, key is kept unchanged. I didn't change the output at this point in time. Now, I again remove the top element from the heap, which is 30 in this case. This is written to the output run. The last element being output is 30. I have to adjust the variable. I'm about to draw 26. Is 26 greater or equal 30? No, obviously not. So similar to the 16 before, 26 has to be put to the list. I do that in the visualization. And again, I proceed removing the top element from the heap, that is 40 put it to the output run, last element is 40. I'm about to draw 33, that's not greater or equal, also uh, has to go to the list. Um, I'm about to draw 50, is 50 greater or equal 73? No, also goes to the list, and so forth. So that, that's basically the situation I'm, I'm in here now. So now there's no element to remove from the heap anymore. There's no, the heap is empty, but I have this list of elements I kept basically aside. So now what I do is I bulk load that list into my new heap. The heap is empty. I bulk load that. Now I have a new heap. The list gets empty. And then I, I start all, all over again with the algorithm, again, removing the top element from my heap. That's 16. I remove 16, and now you see, well, there's a gap, right? Yeah, this, this is ascending here from 10 to 73, but 16 
is like a new value. So what this means is here, I logically start a new run. This run is now complete, run zero. You see in this example already, this is a six elements, even though I only had four elements in main memory available. So it's longer than the available main memory in this case. Um, yeah, and then I, I run the algorithm over and over again. Again, here I draw 31. I'm about to draw 31, make the comparison, greater equal 16, insert it into the heap and uh, pop uh, the entire heap to the output run because there's no more data here. And basically that's the end result in this example. That is replacement reduction. Isn't that a beautiful algorithm? I really love that algorithm, it's fantastic. And um, yeah, here's pseudocode for that. Um, yeah, basically, it's exactly what I explained so far. I think we don't have to go through that. Again, the interesting property here is the heapify operation. Maybe a little note on how this join structure is organized, uh, because um, maybe that, that's not too obvious. How do you organize this heap and list in a common structure? Well, the idea here is that you just keep an array of size m. So basically at all times you only have this array in main memory. It has four slots available. And a certain part of that structure is called the heap and another part is called the list. So if you go back on the slide and uh, whatever, mm. let's make it this situation. Yeah, he would say um, the heap for instance could be um, this, that is my heap and everything else is my list. Yes, you have three values, uh, 16, 26, uh, whatever, 33. It's in the second half, uh, th second part of the array and 73 sits here, but it's one array of size four, four slots available. And then you basically always move the boundary till eventually you end up with a list only. Yes? So basically uh, what happens during the algorithm is that this boundary here is moved. Yeah? It's always moved to the left, yeah? the, 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 the heap shrinks and the list grows. Eventually it's just a list of size four. And then that's a moment where you run this, that's visualized here. Oh, that's basically this line, where you run the heapify algorithm. Heapify meaning you create from that list, you bike load a heap. And how does that work? Um, if you go to what a, basically what a heap um, uh, looks like, basically, um, that right. So basically, it's a heap. Um, it's a binary tree in the end. Yeah. That's basically how, a, um, <clears throat> how that would look like. And uh, uh, the invariant that that must hold in, in such a heap structure is the top element has the highest priority. In our um, scenario, it means it is a, a smallest run. Yeah. Highest priority that has to be at the top. And then basically you have this logarithmic maintenance operations to, to bubble in and bubble up um, those, those elements. And they have uh, logarithmic complexity because uh, the length of the pass uh, is logarithmic uh, base two. So this has a top priority. So if you naively created a heap, you would have like um, some n log n uh, complexity. But what you could do is, and that's a, a linear method I need a different color here, maybe this one, is um, basically in order to create such a heap, and I'm showing it here for these seven elements, is you do a linear algorithm. And what do you do? Basically, the first thing is to determine for this triangle, what is the smallest minimum? Uh, what's the smallest minimum? What is the smallest element? Yeah, so basically, um, those are three elements with two comparisons. One comparison here, you determine which is the smallest element. The smallest element is put here, right? Then you could do a comparison here. The smallest element is put here. So at the end of these two comparisons, you have the smallest element here in that node. Of course, those nodes are mapped to an array. Yeah? And, then, and then you do the same thing here. Yeah? Again, for this triangle, you say, okay, you compare those two put the smallest element on top. Again, you put those two, put the smallest element on top, which means after those comparisons, um, the, the elements with the smallest uh, value or in a more general sense, the highest priority uh, here on top. And then you do the same thing recursively, like bottom up, yeah? Now you do the comparison, let's change colors again, comparison on this triangle, yeah? You do one comparison here, one comparison 
there. That's a basically, and if you, if you count the number of comparisons you perform, it's uh, equivalent to the number of elements available in that, um, that binary tree. Yeah? And the binary tree is mapped to an array, of course. Yeah? It could look as follows. So the top element, um, yeah, I want to have white color. Um, yeah. So that's basically the root node, then the next level, those two nodes, yeah, and then the next level is four nodes. And of course, um, you map that to an array. And that also makes it very easy to maintain this joint structure because you also map that list to an array. If you go back to this visualization, basically, uh, basically uh, that's just one array we're talking about. Yeah, the heap is, kept, uh, is um, stored in an array or mapped to an array and the list as well. I'm just moving the boundary back and forth. Yeah, that's an, an other interesting trick you can play in implementing replacement selection. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, and once you have that in place, now we have external merge sort. You can uh, do replacement selection if you want, to which increases with high likelihood the number of merge levels. You create bigger runs, yeah. And then you have fewer runs. Maybe you have fewer merges. Yeah? You can also compute all of these effects, of course. But uh, I think you get the intuition already of that. There are other tricks you can play. And that is, what about, I mean, we're in a database, right? It's not about sorting. We also want to group and aggregate, as shown above uh, already. But let's assume we have a query like that. We want to select, we want to group on some attribute, and then we want to count the number of occurrences. So in this scenario, I only have one attribute. That's the value. So basically, I want to know for each and every value, how often does it appear in my input data set? And that's the query we are computing here. And I wrote it down in SQL here on the left. Well, and of course, what you could do, and that's a trivial thing, but you first sort, and then you group and aggregate. Yeah, Strictly separated. And you could stream data from the... Um, uh, you can also, um, I think we touched uh, the, that already here. So you could stream the data from the sort operation operation whenever possible also to, to the grouping aggregation, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah. But um, in the end, conceptually, you first sort and then you group and aggregate. So basically, uh, visually, I would depict after having uh, the element sorted, you um, do the grouping and aggregation. And that's what I depicted here. So basically, this is the result saying, okay, one, appears, uh, the, the one appears twice, the, the, so there was two I just wrote, the single value. This, this means two appears once, three appears twice, four appears three times, and so forth and so forth. That's the result of the grouping and aggregation operation, counting the number of occurrences. Yeah, but um, yeah, what if you did that earlier? So what if you combined the merge operation with the actual grouping and aggregation? And that has actually a, or can have a tremendous effect in the database system. So the idea is basically, rather than first merging those two runs into a single combined run, that may even be conceptually uh, just, uh, just a run, doesn't have to be uh, stored on this. So what you do is you directly compute uh, the result of the grouping and aggregation. And that is then written to disk or whatever medium you're using. And um, it doesn't have to be an eight page run here at that point in time. It can also already be shorter or larger. Yeah? So you're not writing, you're not writing out the, the final run, the final sorted run. You're only writing out the result of the grouping and aggregation. Yeah? That's something that you could do. And of course you could push it down in this merge tree. You could also say, why am I doing it in the last pass already? I could also do it here somehow yeah? saying, okay, Already, when creating those first runs in pass zero, you could say, well, I don't write out the sorted runs, the four page runs we had initially, I already write out the grouped and aggregated result. Yeah? So that's um, possible f um, f in this scenario as we are only counting. Yeah? It's more difficult if you have an average um, aggregation, but of course that can be split up into a sum and then count again and then do the average afterwards. So there are aggregation functions for where, where it wouldn't work directly or doesn't work at all. But for, for 
this aggregation function is called a distributive uh, aggregation function that works. Yeah? And then, of course, by that, you, you save a lot of work. Yeah? And you see there are intermediate results, of course. Yeah? For instance, here we have this three comes from the left, th another three here comes from the right, and then here, oh, here the bracket is missing. Basically, you have uh, three appearing uh, twice, uh, and then only this is a final aggregate, and these are kind of intermediate results. Yeah? So we only see intermediate results in the merge tree, but in the end we see the final result. But the, the bottom line of this technique, and the major impact of this technique is we save I.O. We save tremendous amounts of I.O. If you think about, if you keep the entire data set in the merge phases, uh, right, reading it from disk, writing it to disk, back and forth, uh, it's a lot of I.O. work, um, in particular when disks are involved. Uh, that may be very costly, but if you know already, I, I only saw it because I want to do grouping and aggregation, then you can fuse the grouping uh, operation into the merge tree, into the um, merge tree of external sorting, and by that you can gain a lot. Huh? And in fact, in this simple scenario, I mean, this was now grouping and, and counting. For each group, I want to have the count, but assume you only wanted to count, yeah? then the entire algorithm <laughs> falls apart, basically, because then, well, if I only count, well, what is this run generation? Well, actually, if it's only about counting the number of tuples, I actually don't really have to load the data and sort it in my memory. I just keep a counter, I count the tuples. That's my intermediate result. There's another intermediate result. And then I merge those intermediate aggregates. Well, then this doesn't make sense anymore, right? It's basically, um, you could run, keep one integer at all times and just scan the input relation counting tuples would have the same effect. But basically, um, that, that, that highly depends on the type of, uh, of grouping and aggregation you're performing. Yeah? For such a simple aggregate, uh, basically the, the entire merge tree falls apart. Yeah, that's a very important technique in, um, in large-scale data processing. Yeah, and with that, we're already at the summary. So we've learned about four principles of join algorithms today, nested loop. Index nested loop and an important special case is a simple hash join. Simple hash join is vitally used in particular in my memory database systems. It's so simple, it's super fast. And also many interesting extensions you can do there. That's the most important join algorithm in database systems, full stop. Then there's a sort merge join algorithm. We will also revisit that um, because it's an important algorithmic paradigm. It's very useful in situations when the data is already sorted. Yeah, if you if you join two relations and you still have to sort uh, the data using some n log n algorithms, that may be too costly. But if both relations are already sorted, well, that algorithm may be very cheap. Assume a situation where you read um, data from a B tree, where on the leaf level the data is already sorted to the join key. Well, you can just read the leaves. Basically, you don't have to sort the data anymore. You have directly the right input for your merge algorithm. Huh? That's the that's situation that may apply. And the other um, type of algorithms are partition-based algorithms. We kind of scratched the surface when talking about uh, co-grouped joins. Basically, uh, partitioning always means, like in, an, uh, in a logical index, you create horizontal partitions. Yeah? You create horizontal partitions, you build co-groups, and you somehow join those co-groups using whatever algorithm. That's the key idea of any partition-based algorithms. And there are many, many tricks you can play there as well. Yeah, and uh, the other important takeaway here is really it's not about just um, these uh, join algorithms. These techniques can be used to, um, to implement almost all other relational algebra operators, like grouping and aggregation. We, I showed examples of that in, in pseudocode. Intersection, yeah? you intersect two relations um, set intersection, just have the tuples appearing in both. Same thing. Uh, different same thing. Yeah. Remove the ones uh, that, that appear on the right. Cobra grouping, uh, I showed that explicitly. It's always the same algorithmic patterns. That's a nice thing. Once you understand these algorithmic patterns, um, everything uh, gets uh, really easy. Um, yeah, and again and again and again, and again, external sorting, it's not about sorting. The, the algorithmic patterns you see there, the, the patterns that are used to, to master I.O., the tricks you play, like uh, fusing stuff, uh, um, as shown in this merge-based sorting algorithm, but also if you do the co-partitioned, um, the co-group join, those are key algorithmic patterns um, 
that you, you that, that reappear over and over again in, in, in various different different places to master data bigger than my memory. In particular, for instance, maybe some of you uh, heard about um, Hadoop, MapReduce. It was very popular like 10 years ago. Now it's not anymore. People are using S Spark. But there was a time when people were using um, Hadoop MapReduce. And what Hadoop MapReduce does is basically external merge sort followed by um, merge-based grouping and aggregation plus early aggregation. So what I showed you here is uh, this, um, where were we? Uh, basically this algorithm, that is Hadoop MapReduce. If someone wants to know what's Hadoop MapReduce, show, show, show them that slide. That's what what's Hadoop MapReduce was all about. And uh, so in Hadoop MapReduce, uh, there was a framework allowing you, that, that, that is a framework, still exists, is a framework allowing you to, to sort arbitrary large data sets group them and aggregate them, plus you have opportunities for early aggregation. But that's that's it. That's it. Yeah? And this uh, is, works super well if what you're planning to do can be mapped to sorting plus grouping and aggregation. If you can't map it to sorting and grouping and aggregation, well, then Hadoop MapReduce was the, right, the wrong tool. And that's why people moved away towards more flexible uh, frameworks like Spark. Yeah? But in the end, that's what this big hype on Hadoop MapReduce was all about. Yeah, and finally, I showed opportunities to fuse algorithms. So early aggregation, as just explained, is one example. There are more. You can also do that with join algorithms. Um, you can also fuse and join algorithms into the sort uh, operation. Um, many, many other aggreg aggregation type algorithms can be fused, uh, but that's a longer story. That's it from my side for today. So thanks for watching. I will be available in the audio channel of Discord right now. We will see each other on Friday, 12.15. Then there is another lab on query processing. Till then, stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye.